Okay, I think uh, I can start. First of all, thanks for coming to this big best friend, big data and Hadoop session. And uh, I want to thank Joachim for not pushing, uh, not putting any pressure on me. So, um, first of all, I want to introduce myself. Who am I? Uh, my name is Dusan, and I am working for a, a concentric noise side office, as you all can guess. And uh, basically, what I do and what's how my career developed so far. Uh, I come from mainly Java web app uh, development background and uh, JavaScript is my first love and uh, I think I really gladly remember those days when uh, I used uh, j native JavaScript to develop Ajax applications with DVR libraries and uh, Joachim just spoken, uh, has spoken about Clojure so that's uh, where I learned a lot of uh, similar stuff. Also, I played around with the Android platform. That's a really cool platform. If you haven't any experience with it so far, please try it. And uh, currently, I'm working on a big data project. Uh, I'm supporting one of uh, our clients in building their reporting system. I am currently working as a QA resource, as a QA person. So I'm taking care that some of components are working fine. Um, what I will talk about today is me. That's already covered. Uh, then I will talk about big data in general uh, to get a better understanding what big data really is, uh, what, what are the problems of big data. I will talk again in general about MapReduce algorithm. We already heard some things about that by, uh, in that nice talk uh, of Dennis. Uh, then I will talk briefly about Hadoop platform and Pig, la pig Language. And after that, I will. Uh, I hope I will manage to present you a small showcase uh, that will actually give you some insight how uh, Java uh, is used to implement uh, MapReduce jobs and how we use PIG to do it. And after all, I hope we will have some conclusion. So, big data. I think this is how it all looks. I might be wrong. But um, I think that we can say that uh, big data is actually a revolution that will transform, transform the way we live, we think, and uh, we work. Uh, as Mirko has spoken already in his keynote, there are three main characteristics of big data all uh, start with letter V, so people call it three Vs of big data, volume, variety, and velocity. Uh, I will cover that later, but uh, I will try to do that to explain those uh, uh, characteristics using some examples, everyday examples where big data is used. Some of them are really nice, some are funny. So about the volume of big data, volume is actually the main characteristic, the, the principal characteristic of big data, because, and that's why we call it big data. Basically, I think that uh, there was one sentence I read somewhere that uh, the amount of data that mankind produced for the beginning of uh, history of mankind from the first written or drawn picture until the some year of uh, 2002, 2003 was the same exact the amount the data, uh, uh, of data that mankind produce, produced in just two days in 2008. So it's really amazing stuff. And there are some numbers just to show you uh, how uh, big impact is, uh, how really, how much data uh, mankind produces these days. And, uh, interesting stuff is that some uh, studies report and predict that by the end of 2020 uh, this will be the uh, size of digital universe and I think that some studies also report that uh, actually uh, mankind will use only 30% will analyze only 30% of that large set of data we, we gather. So uh, about a variety of big data almost every organization these days have to deal with uh, large amounts of data. And uh, some years before, uh, re uh, regular uh, relational databases were used to store their data and to analyze it afterwards. But these days, uh, the biggest growth comes from uh, the world of unstructured data. So 
what it can be. It can be any kind of documents, um, any kind of web blogs with documents. It may be a Mesa, uh, website, it may be any kind of written documentation. So uh, mankind is using, uh, is analyzing uh, sensor data, for example, those drills that are drilling the crust of the earth and in, in, in searching for um, oil and gas or whatever. So people are sharing videos and photos, that's all, all some kind of data. Uh, again, medical devices and sensors of those medical devices. And of course, don't forget the social media, people are interacting to each other. So that's, and uh, the problem is basically it's unstructured. You have no uniform uh, uh, formats for anything like that. So that, that's the problem, how we are going to store it, how we are going to analyze it later usefully. Uh, it looks like more than 90% of this big data is unstructured. So relational databases not fit here. And uh, yeah, as I said, around the third uh, percent uh, third part of it will be valuable, will be analyzed really by 2000, uh, 2020. Uh, about velocity, uh, that's third part of uh, big data, third main characteristic. Uh, big data is, I mean, information these days are generated at high speeds and it's real and it needs a real pro uh, real time processing or almost uh, uh, real time processing. Uh, one of these examples, maybe a boring one, but it's, it's a rather good one, is that in financial world, uh, for example, there are thousands or millions of transactions in each second, in each uh, minute, that have to be analyzed and, and checked uh, for possible fraud. Or in retail, as you know, uh, for example, Amazon or uh, probably any web store, web-based store, is analyzing click streams of their uh, users to offer uh, sensible recommendations to, to the user and to um, in, increase their profits. There is also another uh, characteristic of big data, which is actually uh, a value of big data. And uh, value of big data is potentially great, but can be, as it's written here, released only with the right combination of people, processes, and uh, technologies. Big data can unlock significant value by making information transparent and usable at much higher frequency. What does that actually mean? It means that we are gathering information and only if we uh, process, process it properly, analyze it properly, we are going to find out what that information actually hides from us. Some really nice examples. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, they are actually building uh, and al already built and improving every day. Uh, how they said they are measuring heartbeat of a city. Rio de Janeiro is a really big city. They have like 7 million people or, or so. They have like uh, 4 million passengers uh, every day. They have 50, 60,000 police officers. And what they do, they are monitoring. Uh, the, yeah, they have really nice, na nasty climate. It's a tropical monsoon climate. So what they do, they are actually monitoring climate, uh, their traffic with the GPS tracks, uh, tracked buses and emergency vehicles. They are uh, monitoring their police. And actually, they are using all of that information. They are using all of that data in order to uh, predict where and when could problems happen and to prevent those problems. Also some uh, more examples in uh, product development. Uh, let's assume that we are developing some product. We don't want to use our time to develop some unnecessary features. What we want to do is to analyze the behavior of our users and to push only most valuable feature, features into our product. Uh, in manufacturing, uh, Toyota does it. I mean, every serious company does it. Uh, analyze your uh, working, produce uh, uh, your working process, and you will be able to find uh, problems much earlier than than without that. And yeah, a really nice example. This I, I put it in the sales. I call it beer and diapers because uh, I think one of the maybe it, it was Walmart or, or one of those really big chains of superstores, megastores, however. Um, they are an, actually, they analyze their uh, checks, the, the, the bills of, of their customers, and they realize that 
it's really good thing to put a beer in one side of the store and diapers on the other part of the store. And why is that? That's because uh, wives are probably back at home with their children and guys are in the store buying diapers. And guys, while they are at the store, they want to buy beer for, their, for themselves and for the friends. And it would be completely wrong to put beer beside diapers because you have it all in one place. You want to have it separated in order to force the guy to walk through the whole store and to buy some other things. So I guess, again, increasing profits. There are possible issues. Uh, Mirko already addressed that, uh, uh, stating that some of the companies are buying uh, users' uh, data. So privacy, security, again, intellectual property and liability, they, that is something that uh, can be really dangerous and, and vulnerable in, in big data world. So how we process big data, that, that large amount of data. This is a definition given by Google guys who actually invented a MapReduce algorithm. I'm not going to read it, but um, what actually is being, uh, what's actually happening uh, in a MapReduce algorithm is uh, very simply uh, presented here. We have some input data, some really large amount of data that we want to process. What we do, we split it. We split it and we analyze only, uh, in parallel, we analyze only fractions of it. And th then we do a little bit of shuffling or uh, uh, sorting or whatever. And then we finally, those uh, pieces, we collect them back to us. And we, as uh, the process is called reduce, we reduce them and we have our uh, output, output result. Uh, that's where Hadoop comes in. Uh, yeah, a little bit of history. So uh, in the beginning, there was a product called, named Notch. And Notch was uh, developed by the same guy uh, who developed Lucene search uh, engine. And his idea was to uh, uh, create another uh, web engine, search engine. And that's why Hadoop was built for, for those purposes. And it's important to know uh, which problems uh, Hadoop uh, really address. It address problems with uh, enormous uh, amount of data, uh, with uh, problems that have uh, data that is not fit for relational database, so it's not structured or it's semi-structured. Of course, it can be structured, but this is the main goal, the, uh, fitting it, it in, into Hadoop, that it's, it's not structured. And in those situations, you need Hadoop in those situations when you have computationally extensive jobs like indexing every single web page in the world and examine the behavior of every single user you have as exactly what uh, Google did. And uh, if we compare Hadoop and uh, traditional relational databases, there is one sentence that, that really describes it. That I will uh, probably come back to that later. Uh, it's not like uh, get data I want to process. It's more like send the code uh, where data really is and let it run there. And uh, Hadoop is designed to, large on, uh, large, uh, to, to run on a large number of machines that don't share any kind of uh, storage between themselves. That's important stuff. HDFS. HDFS is part of Hadoop platform, and it stands for Hadoop Distributed File System. It's designed to run on a large number of machines, as I said, but it's designed to run on commodity hardware, which means you need cheap computers for that. You don't need one big uh, database server or whatever. You need small rack servers. That's what's cool. And, uh, it's highly fault tolerant and yeah, basically there are some assumptions and goals that were built into Hadoop and into HDFS. It's that if you have a cluster of like uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of boxes, there is high probability then that uh, some of those boxes won't work. So you have to be able to easily uh, switch and, and uh, include one and to take other out. Also, uh, data has to be easily uh, accessible. It has to work on large data sets, so files that are put in HDFS are uh, not like megabytes. 
then you're having a really big overhead. Those are like hundreds of, hundreds of megabytes or even gigabytes. And remember that we are actually dealing here most probably with the textual files. Could be that there are binaries, or, but it's, it's mainly textual files. And it's uh, designed for write once, read many, so no updating some, somewhere in the middle of the file. And it's, as I said, uh, designed to move the computation and not the data. Because if, what if you want to you know, uh, process and to analyze hundreds of terabytes of data? Are you going to wait for all to, that data to come to you? No, you're going to waste time. I, uh, yeah, I read somewhere that uh, one of the companies, probably those, uh, one of those with the drilling stuff uh, in drilling business, they had a one query that they uh, had to uh, let to run like four and a half weeks to get the results. And then they uh, moved all of their data from relational database to Hadoop. And that same uh, equivalent of that same query uh, uh, got back with the results in 12 hours. So that's quite an improvement, I think. A little bit about HDFS architecture and the components. There is one uh, central component which is called name node. Uh, HDFS architecture is master slave architecture, so name node is the master server, and each HDFS cluster has a single name node. What name node does, it uh, manages client's access to the, uh, to the Hadoop cluster and it keeps track where data is kept. So name node actually uh, doesn't keep any data on itself. It, it does keep meta information about data, directory tree or however you're going to call it. Uh, and unfortunately, it's single point of failure at that moment. Guys are working on it. They are uh, working on producing uh, Hadoop 2.0 or uh, better version of Hadoop, and they are going to address this uh, in the future. Uh, of course, there is secondary name node, which is, I think, uh, unlucky called that way, because we, when we read secondary name node, we think this is a backup or something, but it, it really does not provide any real redundancy. What it does, it monitors the work of name node, and it keeps track, uh, makes like snapshots of the namespace in time, and you can use that data when your name node goes down, you can use that data to get the, the cluster back and running. Uh, there is, data node is uh, another component that's actually uh, very important and uh, you don't have one data node, you have hundreds, thousands of data nodes in your cluster. Those are actually boxes that store data in the file system and they talk to the name node and respond to the requests that come from the name node. Uh, also, data nodes are talking to each other, and this is how data replication is done. And uh, by default, Hadoop has uh, uh, each file in the cluster has three copies, I mean, one original and two copies. Then we have task tracker. Task tracker should be installed, that component should be installed uh, on the box where data node is or very near it because uh, task tracker accepts tasks from the uh, job tracker and actually runs those tasks. So you need it when you're, uh, where your data, data is in order not to lose any time in uh, transporting data to the tasks. Uh, task tracker has, each uh, task tracker has a, a number of slots that are available for tasks and those tasks are like uh, mapping task, reduce, shuffle, sort, so those kinds of things. And what task tracker also does uh, is uh, sends a heartbeat signal uh, to the job tracker. Unfortunately, in this example, this one died. And there is job tracker. That is component that uh, farms tasks to specific nodes in the cluster, and uh, it's a point of failure for MapReduce. If, if we lose this component, there will be no component that can actually trigger MapReduce jobs. And uh, yeah, uh, one important thing is that uh, task tracker actually runs all of those tasks in a different process because if one of tasks hangs or dies or something bad happens, we don't want to lose the whole component. It's just that task will go away. Uh, and how it all, all goes. Uh, 
client application submits some jobs to Job Tracker. Job Tracker asks the name node where data is. After he finds out where data is, he locates this a proper uh, task tracker and sends task to that task tracker. Task tracker gives its heartbeat to the job tracker. He sends information, how many uh, free slots do I have? Uh, is everything okay with the job I just started and, and such things. And if job fails, task tracker informs uh, job tracker about it and job tracker has to decide what's going to be done. It can uh, uh, respawn the task somewhere else or it can, uh, for example, uh, mark the task tracker as unreliable and blacklist it from the future use. If the job is done, job tracker updates its status and uh, client can pull the job tracker for information and basically that means that everything is okay and you will find your data somewhere in HDFS. Which leads us that we will cover uh, later how MapReduce looks in Java. And, but before that, I want to uh, say some things about Apache Pig. Uh, Apache Pig is a platform for analyzing data sets and it's actually, um, it comes with several components. Uh, one of them is language, that's Pig Latin. And uh, it has a really high level approach. We will see that difference. Uh, comparing to Java MapReduce. It has a compiler. Compiler is used, as you may guess, to compile pig scripts, as we call it, to native uh, Java MapReduce jobs. And it has a grunt shell where you can, as Joachim already show with, uh, shown with uh, Groovy, you can type your Groovy commands in Groovy shell. Basically, this is the same. So you have grunt shell to execute your pig commands. And if we compare pig to SQL, because some guys are, uh, some say that uh, pig is uh, like SQL for HDFS, um, pig is more like procedural language than, uh, than declarative one as uh, SQL is. And when you look uh, to the pig script, you will see that pig is more like execution plan than actually a command by command. So we, we will cover that. Yeah. Uh, a little bit about Pig Latin because I want to show you some, uh, some uh, examples just to, to have some clue how Pig actually works. It's all about relations in Pigs, in Pig scripts. Uh, so a relation is a bag. A bag is a collection of tuples. A tuple is an ordered set of fields. A field is a piece of data that we actually need and a relation is referenced by name or as we call it alias. This is how it looks like. And I think it's very simple to understand what's being done there. We are loading student, whatever that means, that basically we are loading some file that is called student using pig storage, which is default storage. This is how our, our data is looking like and this is the result beneath it. Um, shortly and briefly about data types that are covered in, uh, by PIG. Uh, there are simple ones, there are complex ones. Simple ones are all that we expect from a language that makes sense. Complex, as I already said, a tuple, a peg or a map. And this is how they are represented in string form. I think this, that's, that's understandable easy. Uh, about, yeah, a little bit about uh, schemas in, in PIG. Uh, why do we need them and, and where, where to define them? Uh, as I said, we are dealing with unstructured data and if you just uh, load the data in your relations and you just give them a name, it's high probability that in one moment in, in your PIG script you will not know what actually your relation holds. And this is why you want to define schema and how to do it, uh, specifying name of the field and specifying uh, the uh, type of the field. In this case, we don't have a type of the field defined, so byte array is default. And in this case, we don't have a schema defined at all, so we don't know what, what's there. Some operators just 
showing them for example purposes or what we expect. Uh, yeah, some of the uh, built-in functions and built-in uh, mechanisms, mechanisms in PIG. Uh, what's interesting here, maybe this part and this part, and why I'm mentioning that, because it's fairly easy to extend PIG Latin. What you have to do is to define a user-defined function. Uh, currently, five languages uh, are supported, Java, Python, JavaScript, Ruby, and Groovy. And what is so cool about Pig is that Pig will recognize the language you are using, at it, and it will ship the proper jar to the backend. So if you, for example, uh, write your uh, UDF in Python, uh, Jiton jar will be uh, deployed to the backend, to data nodes where jobs are running. Or if you use, it, use JavaScript, then uh, a Rhino jar will be deployed and, and it's all out of, out of the box. Uh, how to write a new DF? Basically, if you want an evaluation function to be implemented, then you have to extend evil func uh, class and same stands for a load function or store function. How do we uh, use uh, defined, uh, user defined function? It's simply, we, in our pig script, we register the jar file. We say where the jar file is, the, the one that con contains our UDF. We define the name of the UDF if we like. If we don't, then we have to call it by a fully qualified name. If we do, we just call it with the name we just gave it to him. And we call it. Which leads us to our best friend Hadoop uh, showcase. And that's all about... Um, let us assume that we have a social network that's actually, for example, called your FaceTube or something. And we have that's imaginary social network with uh, really, really lots of users, like millions or why not, billions of users with their friends and girlfriends and boyfriends and whatnot. So there is a new relationship. New relationship arises, but new friend is not shown in our news feed. And what is the goal of our network, or of our your FaceTube network, is to present us only the valuable information, only, only information we want really to, to know. Because I really don't care what some guy that I didn't see for like 15 years is doing. I really don't care. So I really want some important people to show there. And where are his activities? How, how will I get them? What would be my proposal how to do it is find out the value of that relationship. Okay, in the beginning, the value of new relationship is zero. But what we do is monitor and log user activities. And now, having in mind that we have uh, lots of user, uh, users and we are monitoring each user's activities, you can get a feeling how that data is going to be big and, and we are we are probably going to deal with a large amount of data. So each activity has some value. We will call it event weight. Okay, we record user activities, as already said, store those logs somewhere in HDFS, analyze those logs from time to time, once a day, once per week, once per month. It depends how we, re we really want to be quick in uh, ordering those news feeds, and uh, calculate needed values show only the activities of important friends. So, if, for example, I have like 350 friends. Uh, by doing this, we can calculate the value of uh, every relationship I have and maybe present me only just top 20. And if I really want to see what other people are doing, then I will have to search them and to find them, for example. And this is how our input data could look like. So. For the purposes of example, this will be just a JSON record with a timestamp when the event happened. A source user will be the user who triggered the event. Target user will be user who was the target of the event. Uh, event name just for the description purposes and the value of the event. This is, for example, some, some uh, events that we can monitor, we can track. So. If I view details of some people or I really click on their name and go to their profiles and you know, uh, look all of their pro uh, photos from the last visit to the, to the seaside and, and uh, uh, I like some of them photos or whatever. So basically, 
you understand that. And this is how our Java map reduce function should uh, class would look like. You can guess it has one method that is called map and one method that is called reduce. How uh, map method looks like is very simple. I wrote a JSON parser for this. Uh, I didn't use Groovy for parsing, so a little bit of boring stuff there. And uh, what it does, it just takes one by one. This uh, map method is called for each record in the file each time. Uh, so one time for each record, sorry. And what it does, it takes the record, parses it, and uh, gives me back string uh, array of tokens, and I extract just data I need for this example, source user, target user, and event weight. And then I write that out in our computational context. In this case, our source user will be our like key of the whole uh, happening. On the other hand, a reduce function has the input in exact, fo exact format as our map function has its output. So what we do here is we uh, iterate over all of those uh, taking again the target user and the weight of the event. Uh, in the next slide, we, again, okay, we are iterating and we are uh, summing up all of the event weights. We are counting, actually, the events, and we are putting that, uh, we are grouping that all by target user. You remember, this is reduce, is called one uh, each time for each source user. So we are doing a little bit of sorting here by, by weight. So we want to have the heaviest one on the top. And then we are again iterating over uh, those ordered interactions and just uh, producing our output as we want it and writing that out in our uh, computational context, which in this case means this will be uh, somewhere in our HDFS. And this is how it's going to look like. So it's not pretty, I know, but it's useful. And now I will just, uh, if I find my, yeah. So this is my virtual machine with the uh, jar file already in place. I will going just to run it. So I'm currently, yeah, Hadoop, uh, when it's installed, installed, it has a number of users. So it's basically some kind of Linux system. Uh, so I could not run this as a root user because Hadoop will prevent me of uh, accessing all of its data. So I'm currently MapRed user and I'm running this with, I, ha I say Hadoop jar, so Hadoop knows that he has to run, it, it has to run a jar file. This is the name of the jar. This is a, a, a name of the class that actually implemented MapReduce job. I'm specifying the input uh, of the, this map reduce job and I say when I, uh, where I want it to be placed in all in HDFS. Uh, so yeah, this user interaction blog, uh, inter user interaction big JSON is JSON that I generated and I think it has like five millions of records or something. So what I will do, I will just press enter, wait for a second or two and now it's running. So this is going to last for some time. So I will just go back to, nope. Yep. We will come back to our example later. And now I want to show you some things about pig, how everything uh, will be, how this same thing will be done in pig. Again, our JSON loader, I extended load function. So I implemented custom JSON loader. This is stupid, stupid thing to do because there is JSON loader provided by pig, but I wanted to do so in order to show you some stuff here. What I do is uh, I specify the text input format. I specify the input format, which is in this case text, in, text input format, which means we are dealing with plain text. It's not binary, it's not any custom format, so it's plain text. What I do here is uh, override the method called get schema, which actually provides me a possibility to define schema that actually our loader function with, will return. So uh, what I do is just uh, define the number of schema fields. And for each field, I say 
uh, what's its name and what the type of the field is, and I just return the schema, basically the, the array of fields. Uh, again, uh, important stuff with the loader function is method get next. It's something like a combination of map and, and uh, reduce because uh, map function in Java approach was called uh, once per each record. This is exactly the same uh, stands for get next method. It will be called for each record in the file each uh, one time. So what I'm doing here is uh, I, ha I have my input reader and if input reader uh, reads null value, uh, it will assume that there is nothing more to read. So uh, if we are not done, we are doing something. If we are done, we uh, just return nothing. Um, then what I do, I uh, take my JSON record, again use the same uh, simple parser, and I create a tuple, and I return that tuple. For each record, record, I produce one tuple, and that tuple will have schema that I described previously. Then we have, uh, again, a uh, function that I extended, uh, uh, evaluation function, and that function is called average weight. Actually, actually, what it does, it takes two parameters, which is the total weight of the relationship between, between two people. It uh, takes a uh, total count of the events between two people, and it does a little bit of uh, simple uh, calculation, and it does a little bit of rounding and scaling, and then just stripping, uh, stripping trailing zeros if there are any, and returning the result as a plain string for formatting purposes, basically. And this is our pig script. So what I do first, I register our UDF jar file. It contains th those functions I just described. Then I define my average weight function with a fully qualified name. Then what I do, I load the information from this uh, location. That's basically the same location that I specified when I started my Java MapReduce. And I say, uh, load it using this loader function. This is uh, what I think when I say it's more, pig is more like execution plan because in SQL you can say do this and that's it. And in this case, I, I say load this data by using this implementation. So you actually can control which approach you are using, which, which implementation are you using to, to load data and to do stuff. Same stance if you are going to join two different uh, uh, set of data. You can specify the type of the join you are going to use. Then we iterate over our data that we actually uh, loaded, uh, just picking up the information we actually need. We are grouping that by source and target user, and we are doing that because we want to summarize some stuff. We want to count the actual event number of events and we want to call our function in order to have average weight of the event between two people just uh, in nice format as we, uh, as we specified it in the uh, function implementation. Then we order our interactions by source user and event weight in descending order, and then we store it, the result into the, the location we want using default pig storage. Uh, now it's good time to pay attention to what actually happened with our example. It's done. As I said, it's ugly. And then we go to the browser. And this is something really nice. It's a tool built by Hortonworks. Uh, it uh, gives you a lot of uh, information how, where your data is and, and uh, how to reach it and, and other stuff. So basically, where, uh, and that's it. So we want to see what's in the results. There is our Java MapReduce directory, and this is how our results <coughs> look like. Basically, very similar to what I already showed. And this leads us uh, to our five minutes. Gone already, yeah? yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, briefly, conclusion. 
uh, a comparison between Java MapReduce and Pig approach is, uh, I think it's obvious that Java MapReduce gives you much more uh, control over the stuff, but it's, it would be probably understandable only for people that actually wrote the MapReduce job and for only uh, technical guys. But in case of Pig, I think that even my mom knows what that Pig script does. So it's easy, understandable for everyone. And if we again come back to our very naive example, and if we have in mind the, uh, the amount of data that actually mankind is recording these days, um, yeah, and this example was really naive, we can, um, what, what scares me the most is that probably uh, people and systems that are actually analyzing uh, that data and our behavior probably know much more about us than we actually do. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>